started, welcome everyone to the sixth edition of the Craftsbury webinar series. Um, our host today, uh, if you signed up for this webinar, chances are pretty good that you already know Marlene Royal. There's hardly anyone with, who, with a more rec recognizable name in master's coaching in North America. And Marlene is going to talk today about improving movement and technique as you age. So without further ado, we'll let her share her screen and get started. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to get this on full screen and very nice to be with you. And the um, topic today is improving movement and technique as you age. And um, obviously, this is a, a very large topic, but I'm going to try to identify some of the key points that we can focus on as masters athletes who are um, adding a year every year and uh, things that we should consider to to continue rowing well and uh, i'm just going to advance to the next oh. okay so one of my sayings is improvement has no age limit and um and i think this is a, a really important point of view um, i know with athletes who i've worked with who are well into their 70s um, who continue to race for those people who are competitive, um, they continue to row better. And, you know, and I, I think one of the most important things is as you get older and like, let's, we'll define that, like say from 50 plus, even though it doesn't necessarily have to be 50 plus, but um, you know, if you don't have the ability to, um, to train more hours, the way that we can make gains is by improving our technique, looking at our movements. Um, what are the things that we can do that will maximize our training and you know, basically give us, give us the most return for our investment in time? This is Hank Osborne. And I love this picture because Hank um, often coaches at Craftsbury. And this is probably a picture that I took of him back in 2004 or something like that. And uh, this was, I think, a great example of balance, coordination, working on continual improvement. So I just wanted to uh, give a tribute to Hank and all of his movements and coordination, which we're going to be talking about in our next slides. Okay, briefly. Um, talking about movement, obviously movement is an enormous topic and there are a lot of different disciplines in, in movement, whether it's sports or dance or activities of daily living. Um, but all movement essentially is controlled by our central nervous system. And I know both Rick and Troy have also talked about um, the central nervous system and how training the nervous system um, relates to how we row better. But, um, but your, your central nervous system is in control of all of your coordinated movements, your balance, your muscle strength, the innervation of your muscles. Um, so these things play a really big role. And, and when we train, in rowing and when we're doing drills and when we're doing physiological training as well, you know, this is all nervous system involvement. So when you are thinking of creating new patterns, think of things on a really small cellular level because the nervous system has to get programmed and has to learn new patterns and communicate with parts of it of the brain there there this could actually be an interesting webinar in itself of how your nervous system actually coordinates the movement because it's really pretty interesting um, we also have to take into account joint range of motion you know as we get older we have different issues with our joints we might have a little bit less range of motion we might have some changes in the the joint surface because of arthritis or because of some degenerative um, joint problems or simply wear and tear. Um, a lot of doctors and chiropractors say that our body was meant to last 70 years, you know, so we know a lot of people who can row well, well past 70, but um, keeping our joints in good shape, 
is very important. But when we have those limitations, these are some of the things we're going to talk about later on, how, how to work around them. Because we're all going to have some issues with joints at some level at some point in our life. Muscle strength has a lot to do with our quality of movement. And I'm not going to go into strength training a lot because um, I think that you'll, you will get that information in another webinar, which will be coming up. So just understand that, you know, we have to have adequate strength to row and you have to have adequate strength to um, execute some of the things in the stroke that we need to execute. Um, so muscle strength is very important and muscle strength is dependent on how well your central nervous system is working to activate those muscles, help them contract in a, in a coordinated way. Another part about movement, which is kind of, um, I put it last, but I don't think it's really last in the sense of priorities, is your volition and your will. And um, there's a lot of concentration involved in improving movement. And there's a system in our nervous system called the limbic system, which is your, basically it's your emotional system. And that's the system within your central nervous system that kicks in when say you say, oh, I'm gonna sprint and I'm gonna pass that boat, you know, in the last 30 strokes, or I'm gonna really put, put on a push for the finish line, or, you know, this workout is getting tough, but I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna will myself through it one, one stroke at a time. So your volition has, um, a big influence in the innervation of and stimulation of your muscles. So it is something that is very important. I'm, I'm not going to talk about it a lot in this um, webinar, but just know that, you know, that's another layer of um, involvement of the, nerve, of the nervous system. So what we'll talk about first is this says assess your movements. And in order to evaluate uh, what you have to do to row better, you periodically have to evaluate your movements and, and you have to look for movements that we need for rowing, obviously. Um, look for movements that could affect your, um, your stroke, could limit your stroke. Are there areas that you need to work on um, because if they are limited, they can affect your pattern in, in your stroke. So I'm gonna go through some of these exercises now. And um, you have in the supplemental material that Erica is posting, there's a PDF that is a, a movement assessment. And that actually will have all of the um, detailed description of if you want to test this, this is how you do it. If you see a restriction, this is one of the corrective exercises for it. And, um, and there's also a link to the program, which also will give you um, video demonstrations of each exercise. So you can, you can either do it just from the PDF or sign into the Craftsbury account that I've created and see the video um, demonstrations of that as well. So here we're, go we're going to go through a series of movements. And these are all movements that are very important for us to execute the rowing stroke properly. So obviously, as we age, some of these motions can be affected or qualities. Um, and it's important that you identify what some of the restrictions or limitations are right from the beginning, because these are areas on land that you'll want to work on so that you can improve um, those motions in the boat, or they're going to um, affect how, how you row. And the first one here is, um, I'm kind of going from the feet up and instead of from the head down, but um, so they're in order this way. But the, the first thing you want to look at is your ankle dorsiflexion and your ankle range of motion. And here in the picture, she, the test that, that the woman is demonstrating here is she has her toes, her toe is like just in front of, of the stick and she's keeping her heel down and she's actually driving her knee forward so that she's flexing at her ankle and um, to see if her knee can get over her toe. 
Um, another way you could look at this is if your foot was maybe an inch from the wall and you were gonna drop, press, push your knee forward, keeping your heel down. If you can touch the wall, that's going to tell you that, that your, your ankle dorsiflexion is pretty good. If that's limited, um, that's something that you're going to wanna work on because that's gonna affect your compression in the boat. And um, we may have to rig around that, for example, and make some adjustments in the boat. Uh, our second thing is hamstring mobility. So this is looking at our hamstring and you wanna make sure that you've got adequate, flex, uh, adequate mobility in your hamstring so that you can do a straight, what we call a straight leg raise. So here, the exercise is keeping one leg flat on the floor and you're going to raise your leg up. In this case, he, he has a string, but you, you would wanna see how far you could go actively without bending your knee. Because again, when we look at our compression, having adequate hamstring mobility um, or when our legs are extended, that's going to affect how comfortable you are setting your body angle and, and compressing. So hamstring mobility is quite important. And as we age, we tend to lose a little bit of extensibility in our tendons and in our muscles. So regular flexibility work is important on land. Good hydration is really important to keep up our mobility and our, and our flexibility. The next motion here is a push-up. And... Um, for rowing, we have to have some adequate upper body strength, um, particularly in our scapula and being and torso strength. And our basic push up is a really good exercise to see if can you execute a full push up? Do you need to modify it? Um, do your hips sag? You know, if you can't complete a full push up, at least for the test, say one. Um, then that's something that you want to look at strengthening that area um, and in the the pdf that we gave with the presentation that also has some suggestions how to work on building up push-ups so that you strengthen your core and you strengthen this area around the scapula because you don't want that to collapse um, when you're rowing we need we need really good shoulder stability to um, be able to connect directly to the handle this motion is um, its range of motion of the hips and shoulder. It's also coordination. And um, I like this exercise a lot, the squat shoulder flexion, because this is going to identify if, if he was holding his hands in front of him, it would be, a, you know, it's a similar range of motion to what you need in the stroke, though obviously he's on his feet. But what we're looking at here is um, adequate hip flexion. Are you able to hinge at the hip without um, collapsing in the back? And, and with this particular motion, we've added the overhead element, which is going to tell us, how, you know, how are the mechanics of your shoulder? Is your scapula gliding and rotating well? Are there issues with the mechanics in your shoulder? Um, and can you do this in a coordinated way? So this is, this is kind of a complex movement that will identify some of these areas. And you know, if you're not able to do this right away, you know, that just shows that, okay, this is something we need to work on. You know, do we need to work on the, the hip mobility? Do we need to work on the shoulders? Do we need to work on just our coordination? So um, this is kind of a complex little test here. Uh, I put in here active neck rotation. Um, as scholars, it's important that we see behind us. And although a lot of people use mirrors, um, you still have to check behind you sometimes to be safe. And you do wanna make sure and check that if you, that you have enough rotation that you can turn and you can rotate to both sides, looking over your shoulder, at least so you can um, use your peripheral vision to see the bow ball. Um, and if you have some neck restrictions, you want to identify those too, because this might be something you can work on to improve. Uh, you may tend to want to turn more to one side or the other when you, when you look in the boat, but this is definitely something that you want to, to pay attention to. 
balance. Um, obviously, we need balance and stability in the boat. Um, and there are lots of, lots of things we do to improve that in the boat. Uh, but here, we need to check this on land. And, and this is maybe um, one of the simplest tests that you can do. And, and it's actually an exercise that I would recommend doing on a daily basis, uh, is balancing on one leg. And in this um, particular picture, she's balancing on one leg with one hand in the air. Uh, you can also do this balancing on one leg with, with your arms up over your head and with your eyes closed. So you can make it more difficult. But what you wanna look for here is, can you stand on one leg for 15 seconds without shifting or having to compensate a lot? And also, um, do you feel stable in your hips? Because the, the gluteus medius, which is your muscle, basically if you put your hand in your pocket, it's the muscle at your hip, and that's a very important hip stabilizing muscle, and it's a very important stabilizer in the boat as well. So your single leg balance is going to, to screen whether you need to do a little bit more work on this on land and this is something that you should do a little bit of every day. Um, I think especially if you're getting into your late 50s, you're crossing into 60, I think this is a really, really good thing to keep your balance in shape because balance can deteriorate, but you can train balance. Um, so this is one of my favorites. This is another one I included here. This is called a one leg um, airplane row. And this, I included this because this, this is a little bit of a challenging exercise, and this is going to test your balance. This is going to test your coordination. This is going to test your, uh, um, your movement ability. So it's, it's kind of a fun little exercise to see like, well, okay, how, how stable am I, you know, working um, contralaterally, which means with one arm and the opposite leg. And, you know, can you, how far can you hinge down to create the motion? Um, how much do you compensate? If you add a little bit of weight to this, you know, how much weight are you comfortable with? So this is a, a good balanced coordination exercise that I think is kind of fun. But it does give us some information as to, you know, how's your system working overall? And that's what we need to pay attention to on land. This other exercise I really like, and uh, this is a half kneeling overhead press. Uh, he's doing it with kind of a, a kettlebell, but you don't have to use a very heavy weight. But I would suggest using a little bit of weight. And the reason I included this as a screening exercise is because here we have an, al an element of balance. He's on one knee. We have an element of working one side, one side opposite to the other side. And we also have the component of checking your shoulder mobility and how stable is your, your shoulder mechanics. And I would suggest trying this with about 15 pounds if you can, because if you were going to lift both arms, the weight of a boat is about 30 pounds. And often lifting a boat up over the head can be pretty challenging for some people to do by themselves. But I do think it's something that if you need to carry your boat by yourself or you need to take your boat from the car, um, you need to make sure that you can lift up over your head and that you, can, that you can press at least 30 pounds or how much your boat weighs. So this is one exercise that can help you um, check that and, and also build up. Okay, the last couple exercises here are for our hands. And we don't often think about our hands a lot, but I think it's quite important to isolate how well your hands are working. And there's a couple of different motions here. And these three motions, if you can execute these motions, they're going to influence whether you can learn to feather and square with your fingers versus using your wrist. So um, this exercise or test is called the isolated lum lumbricals and your lumbricals are the muscles that they straighten your fingers and flex at your knuckles that's what lumbricals do they're they're in between your fingers and i being able to isolate that motion 
is an important hand coordination for how we're going to handle the oars. It's also just a good way to see, do you have any joint mobility? Do you have any restrictions there? Is it uncomfortable? Um, do you have any arthritis? So this is one, mo one component of our flexion to check. The next one is what's called a, a flexor fist. It's FDS, which means um, flexor digitorum superficialis. And you don't have to remember that, but that's the muscle that, that um, curls the middle row of your knuckles. So this is, and, and our handout explains how to do this and has a demonstration, but this is how you test, okay, well, how is the flexion and how is the muscle activity for this middle group of knuckles here? And then the gliding hook is how to test your tips, your fingertips, okay? And so here we can see these knuckles are staying straight, these joints, and we're just curling down the tips. So those are things that you want to test to see if everything is gliding, do your joints feel well? It also has a little bit to do with coordination. Um, these are exercises that if you have any carpal tunnel syndrome um, symptoms, these are, ex these are the exercises to glide all your tendons separately in your hand and through your wrist. So these are actually exercises that we use in hand therapy for uh, rehab from carpal tunnel syndrome. But for our purposes, we just wanna make sure everything is sort of gliding smoothly. So that's our mini kind of, I'm calling it a mini, mini movement assessment. And um, on the, the PDF, or if you go into the live exercises, these are things you can check for yourself. And basically you want to identify any restrictions. And if you have some restrictions, you know, maybe everything is fine and that's great. I mean, that's what we're hoping for. But if you notice there's some things that could use work, those are things that you wanna work on on land because we, in order for us to continue to row well um, as we age, we need to do work on land. We need to do flexibility work and movement work, um, strengthening work. All these things are supportive of our, our training in the boat. So this brings us to our second section of, of our talk, which is um, what should you focus your technique training on? Okay, I'm getting older. I want to continue to row as best I can, if not faster. And indeed, um, over the years, I have seen uh, scholars who have started sculling in their 50s and they continue to get faster. Or I have seen scholars who um, were rowing all their lives, but when they retired, they really got involved in their sculling, maybe when they were in their uh, early or mid 60s, and continued to get faster well into their 70s because they continued to improve their technique. And I think one of the things that is so important um, is as you, you know, when you're in your teens, 20s, maybe 30s, depending on how busy you are with your career, you can say, well, you know what, I'm just going to go for an extra run, or I'm going to go for an extra row, and I'm going to add another strength session. You know, you're, it's pretty easy if you're motivated to want to add in more training. At some point, you're going to get to the point where you cannot make up the difference with simply training more. You have to train smarter and you have to put a lot more attention on how you are rowing um, because there, there, there is a lot to gain by really, really zeroing in on your, on your technique training, which can save you hours in the gym. And um, your strength training is very, very important. And so that, that's going to support all that you do in the boat. But you do have to consider your recovery time from your aerobic exercises and how to maximize your training time on the water or what to work on on days when you're tired. You know, maybe you're tired, but you still want to go out and do something. You just don't want to do something overly demanding, but you still want to get in the boat and work on things. You know, this is where your technique training can fit in very, very well, your drill work. So 
Um, in a nutshell, these are some of the things we're, gonna, we're going to go through. Um, I feel you should focus your, your technique training on, first of all, protecting your joints so that you re reduce overuse and you, you reduce injury potential. Um, if you're injured, you're not going to be able to row or train very well. So keeping ourselves in good shape is super, super important. Capitalizing on free speed through rhythm and swing. And uh, there's a lot of momentum to be had through technique. And that's exactly, these are the points we're going to talk about. Um, you can get a lot out of the boat with not necessarily a ton more effort if you are paying attention and developing the right things. You must perfect your blade work and your handle skills. Okay, without blade work and handle skills, it's going to be very difficult to capitalize on free speed through rhythm and swing. We want to maximize our effective stroke length in the water, and we're going to talk about that. Um, we want to maximize our effective stroke length, not our absolute. An absolute stroke length doesn't mean that all of it is effective. So we have to focus on what is actually helping us move the boat. We want to continue improving coordination and balance. Um, you want to focus your technique training on moving your boat, body, and oars as a system. So we move the oars past, I'm sorry, we move the boat past the oars and um, it's a leverage system. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Lastly, we're going to go over rigging your boat properly. If you are not rigged properly, it's going to be really difficult to execute any of these points. Um, you simply can't do it if you're rigged improperly. And you also want to maximize your rigging to help you achieve the position in the boat that you need to in order to improve um, your technique and some of the things we're going to talk about. So here I said power through posture. This is, this is pretty key in my book. Um, our first, our, these next two slides are going to focus on joint protection. We put this as our, you know, from a master's point of view, um, I'm putting joint protection first. And, and um, it doesn't matter whether you are a competitive scholar or whether you're a recreational scholar, um, you, you, if you're injured, you're not gonna be able to row. And um, we have to be a lot more careful about our body as the years go on. So our first concern obviously is talking about um, protecting our spine. And um, your safest position in the boat is a neutral spine position and that's not a really curvy spine. You know, it's basically, if you could put your hands behind your neck like this and just sit up tall comfortably, that's placing you in a neutral spine position. If you lay down on the floor, that's a neutral spine position. So it's not a tense position, but um, it also doesn't have a lot of flexion and stresses going, um, working on the small muscles between the vertebrae. Your neutral spine, is very resilient to injury and it favors leverage. So a neutral spine is gonna help you swing on the drive or the water phase. It's going to help you swing versus pulling. That's a huge difference in capitalizing on free speed. Um, for our spine, we want to row tall. So when we're, we're sitting tall in the boat, we're talking about um, Steve Fairburn has a, um, a phrase freely elected or, uh, freely erect posture, which means you're, you're rowing tall. You know, you're not sitting heavy on the boat. You're, you're elevating yourself. Try to get yourself up, your sternum up. Your eyes are looking above the horizon when you're sculling. I even like to look up above the treetops in, and I find a cloud. But you want to, to, to elevate yourself and to stay tall. That's going to assist your freely erect posture, which is going to help your swing. Favor a more collected stroke versus a more separated stroke. And what we mean by this is we still have sequence. We're still moving from larger muscle groups to smaller muscle groups, but we're, we're favoring, or I favor, to blend them more. So I, I would like to see scholars try to complete their legs, body, and arms at the same time. They're still working in the same sequence. They're still working on their power rectangle. 
they're still using their larger to smaller muscles, but there's more overlap than a really strict legs, leveraging the body, arms, um, where that, that is going to put a lot more stress on your vertebrae and a lot more stress on your back to be more separated or segmented than a collected stroke, which was a little bit more holistic um, blending of the body parts type of stroke. Um, in terms of protecting your spine, it's important how we sit on the seat. So you have to evaluate, are you sitting on the seat with a neutral pelvis? And, and so that's gonna mean, are you up over your sit bones? Like we say, off your back pockets? Or is it in a posterior tilt where you're kind of slumping down and um, your, your, your butt is kind of down on the seat? So we say you're sitting down on your pockets. If you had jeans on, you would be smushing your pockets. You know, you wanna be up off your pockets. If you had jeans on, you could slip your hands in your pockets. That's a, new, a position of a neutral pelvis, and you need that position on the seat in order to do our next step, which is to hinge at the hip. And we talk a lot about hinging at the hip at Craftsbury. Um, Will Ruth talks a lot, a lot about it in his strength presentations. And um, hinging at the hip to set your body angle is much safer and allows you to um, maintain that neutral spine position versus trying to flex through your back and stretch through your shoulders and reach, and um, which is uh, usually a symptom of not sitting correctly on the seat. So this could be an area um, for some people. If you find that you're, you're having a hard time to sit up over the seat, you know, you might want to do a little bit of work of, of mobilizing the pelvis and the lower back to get a little bit of mobility there so that you can sit more comfortably on the seat. This, this can be a huge issue in terms of how it affects the entire stroke um, because a posterior tilt is probably gonna put you in a flexed spine position and it's going to bring you up into your shoulders and it's probably gonna encourage you to pull versus swing. So a lot rides on the, on the seat, so to speak. So that is definitely something to focus on as far as improving your, your technique. That's a really key element. Um, here, also in terms of protecting our spine, a nice little trick that I like to use is on the, on the recovery, once you have feathered your oars and, and as your hands are moving out to the crossover, put enough weight on your handles so that it sets your posture. And you can do this as an open fingers drill, but it's just a matter of if you put weight over the handles and Rick Ricky has the term, he says, push the oarlocks down in the water. You know, try to push the oarlocks down. That's gonna bring you up tall. That this is very, very important for protecting your spine and setting your posture without you having to think, oh, you know, I have to do all these things and oh my God, how do I do this? You don't wanna feel like you're holding yourself up. You want this to happen relatively naturally and it has a lot to do with where you put your body weight. Our last little um, point about the spine is activated glutes, those are your butt muscles, um, prevent collapsing in the lumbar spine. So just like how we sit on the seat, if your butt muscles are activated, okay, if you're squeezing your butt muscles, if you're holding those firm, that supports your lower back, that supports your lumbar spine. If you collapse on the seat, that lumbar spine is probably going to collapse. It's gonna put a lot of stress on your, on your lower back. Um, so we do want to avoid what we call um, gluteal amnesia, which likes to kick in in later years. And you know, glutes, our big muscles, take a lot of work to, um, to keep activated and strong. So this is where your strength training comes in on land. Like you've got to work the glutes and keep those strong. It's really key to um, your positioning on the seat and, and protecting your spine. Now we go through the rest of the body like really quickly after we did the spine. So other things, again, this is focusing on protecting your joints. And um, here, shoulders, elbows, wrists, hands. We're just gonna run down the list before we get to our um, other technical points. So 
your core strength, your lats, which are under, you know, lats are big muscles in your back. They, they cover your whole back. They go all the way down, all the way down to your sacrum. They're underneath your arms. Engaging your lats stabilizes your mid back and your shoulders and your shoulder blades. It prevents your shoulder blades from slipping. So when we say lower your shoulders, like this is traps, I'm up into my ears. This is lats. You create distance between the shoulder and your, your ears. Your lats are big muscles. They bring your shoulder blades down. Um, they stabilize your core from the other end of your glutes. Um, they're very, very big muscles. Sometimes you will find after some period of time, just like your glutes, it's hard to target those lats and, and stabilize them. You have to learn how to activate them. People lose their lats really easily. So, you know, one way is um, you feel like you're drawing your armpits together or you want to feel like your muscles under your armpits are getting bigger. You draw, I like to talk about drawing your shoulder blades right down onto your rib cage and hold them there. Don't let them slip around. That's not stable. That's loose. We want to be snug, snug and stable to um, protect our shoulders. Hands, wrists, forearms, elbows. Um, lots of small muscles here. Uh, lots of muscles and tendons that are very prone to overuse. And especially with a sport like rowing, which is repetitive. And if you're rowing for an hour, you're doing lots and lots and lots of strokes. Um, so it's important to pay attention to keeping your hands, wrists, forearms, elbows parallel with the water and above the oar handle. Okay, if you're, if you can see me in the camera, if you're below the oar handle, that is not parallel to the water. You have to stay parallel to the water um, for other reasons too, keeping the drive level, release, etc. But from the point of view of, of joint protection, we want to minimize stress on these joints, which means decreasing the amount of flexion that's happening every stroke. Um, in order to keep the hands and wrists and forearm level, you have to let your hand move on the oar handle. Your hand has to pivot because when you bring your hands into your body, if you try to keep the hands really stiff or um, tense on the oar handle, it's going to drive all your, everything's going to drive down. You're going to bend your wrist, your elbows are going to drop, um, your hands are going to come in straight. It creates an enormous amount of stress on these joints, which we want to protect, especially if you're doing the stroke hundreds of times this way. So allowing your hands to pivot means a, a pivot point at the base of your middle finger and let your hand rotate and follow the path of the handle and keep things level. The major factor of protest, protecting your wrist and uh, preventing carpal tunnel, uh, some of you might have carpal tunnel syndrome from other things like computer work, a lot of driving, um, other, other things you might do a lot of writing with a pen even can create a lot of carpal tunnel syndromes. But carpal tunnel happens when you get inflammation in the wrist where all your wrist flexors go through a very small opening called the carpal tunnel through into your hand and there's a little ligament there that forms a roof and when you flex and bend your wrist you're pushing all those tendons up against the roof so one of my points which i think is quite um, important and may take a little bit of time and coordination is learn how to feather and square with your fingers versus the Harley Davidson method, which is turning your hand with the handle. Allow the handle to turn in your hand so that you can decrease the amount of stress at your wrist. And um, this, this is a very, very big issue. This reduces tight forearms. This reduces all of that. So for your protecting your wrist, it's really important. Um, lastly, for your fingers, maintain a very, very light hold on, on the handles. Um, it's important to take stress off of the fingers and thumbs as, as much as possible. Okay, our next little section. The first way how to go faster is to learn how not to slow down. 
And uh, this is really important for us in our technique training. Um, here, I point number one, really focus, clean up your oar handling and your blade work. You know, this, this is a huge, huge factor in going faster, rowing safer. Um, this takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of, of concentration, but you know, if you're feathering into the water and out of the water and your blades are getting stuck, you know, you're just, you're, you're just putting the brakes on all the time. And, and you, if you let the boat run, um, it's going to be your, all your energy is go, going to go into moving the boat. So, uh, really quickly through here, um, you know, establish your hand placement when the blades are in the water, when the blades are square, so that when you start to drive, your wrists and handles are, are very level. Um, that's important. Really work on drills that are going to help you through the transitions, right? So our transitions are putting the blade in the water, taking the blade out of the water. It's important to square, make the entry part of the recovery and decrease slip. Slip, slip is what we call um, when the blade goes in, but it doesn't have pressure, but you start to row already. That amount that the blade travels before it's really locked on is called slip. Decreasing slip is a huge priority for master's rowers. Um, perfecting the release means coming out square, feathering away from the body. So you've got to make that release before you worry about what's going to happen next on the recovery. The feather is part of the recovery. Your feathering and squaring happen on the recovery. Everything in the water is square in, square out. And um, at the release, we talk about decreasing the wash. So the wash is if you don't come out square or you don't come out on time, you're late, you continue drawing the handles through on the drive, but the oar is no longer propelling the boat. So we call that wash. And these things can be measured. There's instruments out there on the market that you can purchase for your oars or oar locks that can actually give you these factors. So um, that's something that's worth considering for, for a serious competitor. Um, we talked about feather and squaring from the fingers. Another big thing for your oar handling and blade work is sort out your crossover position and make sure that one hand is nested, that your right hand is nested um, behind your left hand, which means your left hand is to the stern and your right hand is to the bow, so that, so that you're keeping the handles very level and you're keeping the angles of the oars level to the water. If you're stacking, which is one hand on top of the other, you've got very different angles of the oars. And um, this is something Rick talks about in webinar three, that you're often gonna find yourself down on port side. So if you're always on port side, that's one, that could be a huge reason why. So working on that crossover position with a little mini pause that you can check that is important. Again, light touch on the handles, let your oar locks Hold the oars when the blades are out of the water. Let the water hold the oars when, when the blades are in the water. Rhythm and swing is another place where we can make a huge gain. Um, if you're not as strong as you were before, if you um, weren't rowing as well in terms of using your body weight, you were doing more pulling than swinging. Um, rhythm and swing is where you can make a lot of gains in terms of just moving, moving the boat better. Um, I put here resources, Rick's Craftsbury webinar number three and Troy's webinar number five, which was last week. Um, Troy's web webinar was about rhythm and really extensive with tons of great exercises and drills, which is why I, I didn't go into these exercises and drills here because um, that is a whole discussion in itself. So if you didn't listen to number five yet um, from last week, please go back and you know, listen to these two webinars because they really build on what we're talking about, what we're talking about today. Um, one of my principles is regardless of your range of motion limitations, okay? It might be shoulder issues, it might be a knee issue, it might be a hip mobility issue. Adhere to the correct stroke uh, sequence and make sure that you're working larger to smaller, stronger to weaker muscle groups. So even if you have decreased knee flexion, 
You know, you don't want to compromise your upper body and your shoulder stability because of a decrease of compression. There's other ways that we can work around that in rigging. Um, again, favor blending your stroke versus a more segmented stroke and overlapping muscle groups is not going to be so stressful as something that's very strictly legs, body, arms, which, which is gonna put a lot of stress on those transition points. Um, we talked about the crossover. In terms of rhythm, work on crossover to crossover. So if, if I'm visualizing a stroke sequence, I, I like to think of the crossover on the recovery as the completion of one cycle. When my hands start to separate, my seat starts to move, that's the beginning of another, another cycle. So you want to keep your handle in motion through the transitions of the entry and the release. And getting out to the crossover is huge in terms of helping you carry the momentum of um, the drive, the momentum of the hands and body away of, of the boat moving towards the bow. So it, it's one of the places where you can pick up your free speed um, quickly without a whole lot of effort. So, so the release is important here because if you're too long at the release, you do not have time to get your body over by the time you get to um, the crossover. But that's an important rhythm um, reference. So I also talked about here sustained power through the drive with suspension and body swing. This goes along with our blended stroke. Muscle groups, using your body weight, using rhythm and swing versus pushing and pulling. Pushing and pulling is a lot of work and it's not necessarily gonna move your boat better. It moves some people's boat fast, it can, but it also um, puts a lot more stress on your joints and on your back. And um, that's just something you're gonna have to weigh the, um, the scales if you want to continue to row that way if it's, if it's worth it versus really trying to uh, suspend your weight and swing, which um, probably will give you a lot more stamina as well because you're not gonna get as tired um, when you're using your body weight more. Suspension is about staying light on the seat. We talk about moving the boat past the blades and um, all these drills that you can do. Um, Rick talks about drills in his webinar. Troy talks about a lot of drills. These, you know, this, you have to do drill work to work on the particular elements that you, that you want to nail down. Um, so coordination and balance, lots and lots of drill work, pause drills, tapping drills, um, square blade drills, uh, round the world when you spin your blades 360 degrees, taking air strokes, um, all kinds of fun stuff like comfort in the boat. That's all going to help you with your rhythm and your swing. Here I put the diamond is forever um, and we're all about rowing longevity. And um, what I mean about the, the diamond you'll see in the, next, in the next slide, it's about some of your positioning in the boat, but um, essentially you, you want to row as effectively as, as you possibly can. So references for effective stroke length mean staying connected to your boat. And when you have pressure to the pin in your oarlock, you know, your pin is the point that your, your handle is moving around the pin. Your handles are moving in arcs through the crossover and around the pin. So in order to row effectively, you need to follow the path of the handle and keep your weight into the pin all the time. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean to, that it's a lot of weight. It means that your collar has contact to the pin all the time. You're not falling away from your pin when you put the blades in the water by trying to stretch too far. You're not falling away from the pin or the rigor at the release because you're trying to pull through too far. When you can no longer feel that uh, contact of your collar to the pin, that's it, that's the end of your effective length. So as you get, as you get better, staying on your circles, I call it, staying on the path of the handle and using that pin and the, the handle path around the pin as a reference for your body weight, 
you will be able to um, work that path of the handles wider. Troy talks about hugging the horizon. Okay, you hug the horizon at the entry. If you're hugging the horizon, your handles are moving outside the edge of the boat, your weight is staying into the rigger. If you're stretching towards the stern, you are not hugging the horizon and your weight is falling opposite to the direction of the boat. Um, the same thing at the release, though, though the arc is smaller, um, if you cannot allow the elbows to separate, allow the handle to separate and stay on that smaller arc of the handle and keep the collar at that reference point, the pin is your reference point for maintaining your connection with the boat um, at that point of the rigger. If you don't feel that, your weight is going to fall down in the boat and fall on the seat. That's going to um, quite effectively kill your boat speed. So um, staying on the rigger, staying around the pin, working with that path of the blade, moving the oars past the blade. This is enormous for moving your boat faster. And as a master's athlete, you wanna be as effective as you can, but you're only as effective as you can be if you're keeping your weight into the pin. If you lose that feeling, you're overreaching or laying back too far and you're not gonna be effective until the weight is back on it. So there's kind of no reason to go there in the first place because we can get you there with rigging, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Um, rigging is big for us. So um, these points we more or less talked about. And my last point here is think in the direction of the travel of the boat. You're going that way. Okay, so other than utilizing a lot of peripheral vision to try to see your blades, um, take your eyes right out of it. You know, um, put eyes in the back of your head so that you're focusing on moving the boat, moving the boat forward. And that's also going to do a lot to keep you in the right um, patterns. This is my little, this is my little diagram here, uh, the diamond frame. So if I were looking at a sculler sitting at the release, I would want to see their elbows um, above the handle. This is my, this is the handle here, the straight cross line. The arrows are the elbows, which are pointing towards the pin. And you can see if I'm thinking really wide, you know, we can extend that right out to the widest arrows, which are our blades. So, you know, think about that nice um, level symmetrical position. And here, if you were keeping, this is another one of my great drawings here. If, um, here's another one. If you were keeping your weight into the pin, you can see that um, our sculler here is, you know, he, he or she is thinking about where their blade is. They're not stretching towards the stern of the boat. They're keeping their weight against where the pin is towards, towards the blade. And that's very stable. You stay, if you stay on that position, you can work on more compression and getting your hands wider. Okay, and here's how our sculler would look at the release. Okay, again, pretend that our sculler is focused on where the pin is and where the blade is, and they're not gonna fall back far enough on the seat um, that they lose that point. Okay, finally, we have just a, a, another two or three minutes here about rigging and boat setup because this is really key. Um, you will not be able to execute some of these things if your boat is not set up properly. So you, so you really do wanna work on your rigging and pay attention to this. Um, one important thing is the oarlock height. Uh, we talked about keeping weight over the handles. We talked about everything staying level to the water. That won't be possible if your oar handles are too high, you're, it's gonna drive your elbows down, your elbows are gonna drop. So you need to lower your oar locks to your center of gravity, which is if you're gonna do a tug of war with a, a, um, a rope, where you pull in is where your oar handles go. Whether you like it or not, that's where they go. So you wanna set your oar locks to be at that level. And that's gonna allow you to rest over the handles. That's gonna allow you to tap down over the handles versus trying to pull the handles down. Really, really, really critical. Um, adjustment, especially if you're rowing in club boats. Prioritize your foot stretcher placement, prioritize your catch angle versus the finish angle, okay? The oars that most of you are rowing with are designed for a steeper catch angle. They're designed for 55, 
60, 65 degrees your, to, the, to the pin. The um, finish angle is about 30 to 35, considerably less. Um, what is going to give you more new speed, I call it, is improving how far you move through the pin. So when you, when you look at strength, stroke length, look at where your hips are relative to the pin. And it has nothing to do with stretching through your shoulders or your hands and all that. You need to let your hands separate outside the boat, but your hips have to be up level with the pin or to the stern of the pin so that your oar is at a steeper angle to the water and you're doing more work from the entry to the perpendicular than from the perpendicular to the release. That is absolutely critical. And um, some biomechanists like Volker Nolte very, very much um, encourage masters to decrease the inboard so, and um, decrease perhaps the overall length of the oar so that they can rig farther through the pin and get that steeper angle. Now, you know, different people, they, you have to do what works for you individually, but in terms of our biomechanics, um, that's the most effective. Then, and you adjust your oar length and inboard um, to favor that angle versus, um, make that the priority versus your, okay. your um, release position. And our last point here is adjust the angle of your footboard and the height of your heels. Um, that will have to do with your ankle flexibility and your hip mobility, how much you can compress. If you can't get up through the pin, you want to um, try perhaps decreasing your footboard angle or making more difference between your heels and the top of the seat will help you compress more. So you may need to um, work with that a little bit more. Seat pads can give you a little bit more height. Um, but if you have a choice, raise, if you have your own boat, raise your seat up with a little shim if you need more height. It's better to raise the seat up than to use a seat pad. But if you're in a club boat, you have to use a, a seat pad. So those things are really important to get you up to that reference point of the pin. And uh, this is just a little diagram, again, of thinking about keeping your hands above your handle and um, staying on the pin. This would be the center line of your hips up through this red line would be the, the orlock pin. So you want to see where you are when you put the blade in the water. And that's about it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> um, we'll get ready for the Q&A. I have a couple questions that people have sent to me. So okay. I can start asking you those. Um, I'm going to ask you the first one and then everybody, I'm going to start sending some links in the chat. So I'm going to link you guys to the supplemental PDF and materials that Marlene was talking about. Uh, in a couple days, you'll also be able to find the video recording of the presentation at that link. Um, I'll also link to the YouTube channel where you can view our previous webinars, because I know some people have asked about that. And the third thing I just want to say before we forget about this. I want to announce next week's webinar, which is going to be given by Will Ruth, who's a strength coach and a rowing coach, um, and it'll be strength training for scholars. So you'll be able to find the link to information about that talk once we get, uh, once I share the link uh, with the information, um, the supplemental materials for this talk. Okay, so first question, Marlene. Um, this is one of the questions that came to me via email um before your talk started um and actually marlene if you want you could stop sharing your screen okay your screen so people can see you full screen um All right. there we there go. go okay and so this question was um this questioner asked um if you could share what element of a training program you would sacrifice to allow for more than one rest day a week So if they would want to train five days a week, um, probably one um, aerobic session, because I think you want to have two strength sessions. You probably want to have two higher quality sessions. They may or may not be intervals, depending on what time of year it is. Um, and then the other days, you know, fill in with your, your low intensity, long distance. Um, so that's 
probably how I would do it. Or I would say if you were going to take a second day off, perhaps um, on a strength day, if it works in your schedule, do, um, do a limited aerobic workout on your strength day. So you, you actually get that sixth session in, but you can, still, um, you can still have a rest day. Lots of people train five days a week. Um, so the next question uh, was from somebody who says, um, I'm 85. When do I figure out um, more is really less for me? It's hard to figure out what's making me stronger and faster versus what's exhausting me. Well, if you're getting exhausted, obviously, <laughs> obviously we have to change something, right? Um, I think you want to look at perhaps decreasing the overall volume, but, you know, continue. Uh, well, this is another thing, like you might look at training five days a week, right? But you don't necessarily have to train five days in a row. You could, you might look at, first of all, um, changing your patterns. You might want to, some people do really well with um, three days of training and a rest day, three days of training and a rest day. So that's one thing that you could um, simply insert more rest days. And, um, I definitely think strength training would be very important here because strength training um, is going to help you keep up your stroke power, which is also going to, you know, if you're doing low intensity training, it's going to take a lower percentage of your overall strength to maintain that low intensity. So um, I, th I would read your log and see like, oh, maybe I've trained six days in a row and that's why I'm so tired all the time. Or, or it hits you all of a sudden and try to work out, you know, work out a, a, a work rest recovery cycle and experiment. Maybe every fourth day you rest, maybe every third day you rest. Um, I think, you know, I think those are things to, you know, uh, look at the recovery, definitely. Okay, um, next question from Elaine Roche asking, how much does stroke rate change as champions age, assuming they stay fit? And how about for masters who start sculling in their 50s and 60s? Oh, I want to ask all you guys. <laughs> so, very good question. I knew Elaine was, I knew she was going to ask this one. <laughs> She's like, I want to talk about stroke rate. Um, it is so, first of all, it is so different. And um, I think when you're, when you're talking about stroke rate, I wouldn't put a, a good or bad value on it. It's kind of like, what's your maximum heart rate, right? I mean, some people are 195, some people are 180, some people are 170. It's not a good or bad factor. It's just yours. And if you are a competitive rower and you're looking at the distance, you know, if you're going to race 1K, if you're going to race the head of the Charles, you know, you use a huge part of your training to figure out what is effective for you. That's why we do trials. That's why we practice things. From year to year, you might um, row better. I mean, one of the, the huge factors of stroke rate is your release timing. You know, if you're too long at the release, you are not, you know, that you just sacrificed two strokes per minute right there, just from a timing point of view. So going back to your blade work can definitely boost your stroke rates. But um, I can give you a couple of examples. Um, one athlete that I've worked with who is in his 70s, who's won the head of the Charles twice, rose, he's 72, 73, rose the head of the Charles at about 30. Lightweight size man. Um, another woman, heavyweight woman who's in her mid 50s would row a race like the head of the Charles. Um, and these, you know, they're at very top fitness, but say 32 to 33. Um, other athletes, um, I know another woman who has won the head of the Charles in her single, who was in her seventies. And, you know, she rose a 26, 27 is a really good solid rating for her. So you do have to figure it out a little bit for your own, um, body type. Some people like to row a little higher. Some people are a little bit more power rowers. They prefer to row a little bit lower, um, but that is definitely something you have to experiment with and, and time trial or compare workouts to workouts. Oh, and awesome. people who start in their 50s and 60s, you can learn everything. Just get the right coaching. You can, you can catch up to all those guys really quickly if you do your homework. 
Uh, okay, so here is a question uh, from somebody who is seeking more mobility of the pelvis to be able to sit correctly and allow hip hinging. And was just wondering if you had some ideas for exercises to increase pelvis mobility. Um, well, there, there are a lot of, a lot of things like um, lower back related exercises. Um, there are a lot of exercises like bridging. Um, I suspect in next week's podcast and podcast web, webinar that um, I, I bet Will's going to talk about this a lot too. But um, yes, definitely uh, learning just uh, pivoting as far as you can, like walking your fingers down your legs until if until you feel a change in your spine you know focusing on that hinge you don't want to to start to collapse and have your spine flex um there are definitely um exercises as i said from bridging swiss ball exercises um and uh would definitely uh yoga helps right there that's a really big one for new, getting neutral in the spine um as well so but yes, it does take some mobility work for sure, but well worth working on. Um, here's a question sort of mobility related as well um, from Pamela asking, how important is it to have your shins perpendicular at the catch if you are at the pin? Some people won't be perfectly vertical depending on their leg length. You know, I mean, there are some, you can watch some elite rowers who are extremely tall and you won't see their shins absolutely perfectly vertical. So it's a guide. Um, I would say it's a guide, but, but you, what you could look at is the height of your shoes and the, um, the rake of your foot stretchers because you might be able to um, get a little bit, you know, what you, what you want to see is can you get a little bit more compression? Um, you can still be to the stern of the pin. You can go through the pin a little. If you can go through the pin a little bit more, that's even better, actually. But you have to look at um, if you're sitting up tall, that gives more room for your knees to come up. If you have enough height between your seat and your heels, that's going to allow you to compress. Um, you have to not chicken out at the top of the slide. Okay, so what I mean by that, if your hands are opening up outside of the boat, you've got to keep your weight on the rigger and on the pin and keep your seat moving until you put the blade in the water um, because that's actually gonna pull you into the top of the slide a little bit. So, um, you know, you might wanna do some top end drills and you can certainly, you can certainly be through the pin, not just to the pin. If you, if you have the mobility, if you can do it, that's, that's an advantage. Awesome. Um, and someone just was asking, um, that they, they were saying they'd like to try a shorter inboard length and were wondering if you knew where they could find recommended or ratios to try with various inboard lengths. Depends on your blade. Um, if you have a, like a smoothie shaped blade that could be a concept two smoothie or, um, or a slick 39 or a slick 40 blade. Um, again, this depends on your overall rigging dimensions. It depends how tall you are. Um, it depends what your span is, but if you had, um, if you had say a 160 span, which is a really uh, good starting point, traditional span, you know, you could start at 86, an overall length of 286. You could row, I row 85 with an overall length of 285 with a 160 span. Um, so, you know, you can experiment with that. What you don't want to do is decrease your inboard a lot and leave a very long overall length because that is going to load you up more and rigging more through the pin increases your load, which is why you can decrease the overall length of the oar. So it just gives you the mechanical advantage. Okay, um, and another equipment related question um, from Sue asking, uh, if you could share any tools that you could, that this person could use um, on the pins or the orlocks to measure wash efficiency and or contact slash pressure on the pin. Well, there are, um, there are a couple like biomechanical tools out there. there there's like, like NK cells, the Empower Orlock. There's another system called Quisky. I think it's Quisky. It's a, um, I think it's a Swiss, it's a little gadget that a little pressure plate that you put on your oars 
um, and they actually will tell you they register pressure on the ores. So they 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 will tell you like you know you've got you know x number of pounds of pressure, x number of joules on the, on the ore. So how it measures the wash and the slip actually it it reads out when there's enough pressure on it and when the pressure comes off the blade. So that's actually done electronically. Um, if you were going to do it without any electronics, I would be, um, I would uh, row with your Orlox open. You're not going to take pressure off the pin if your Orlox gates are open. <laughs> so that's actually, if you row in a double with somebody, um, or you're, you're pretty skilled in the single and you just open one or lock and just row with row circles with just one or lock. You don't even have to be like, you know, cruising down the river. But um, that, that's one of the best exercises in the world, not to pull your collar off your pin. <laughs> so that's really fun. <laughs> awesome. Um, cool. Yeah, and she just said, that's awesome. Open or locks, <laughs> it will be fun. Okay, so. Uh, there are two questions related to erging, so I'll kind of lump those together. Okay. Uh, one person was asking if the concept of the collected stroke also applies to the erg, and then somebody else was asking um, if you could share any erg drills related to your talk because um, they train in open water conditions. Um, if we approach erg, we can approach erging two ways, right? We can approach erging to get a good score, or we can approach erging to um, practice rowing as we would want to row in the boat. So I will take the, the approach of let's practice erging as we would row in the boat because we all know that if we want a good score on the erg, we can lay back really far and pull the handle up really, really far because it's purely the speed of the handle and the distance the handle travels that's going to give you your, your reading. Um, the erg rewards you for the drive. It does nothing for you on the recovery. However, on the boat, that's a very different story. So on the erg, um, what I mean by collected is aiming, aiming your, your swing and your arm draw with the leg drive so that you're, you're completing pretty closely legs, body, arms at the same time. Um, you're still blending those muscle groups together, but a couple of drills, one, row with your feet out, um, don't strap your feet in unless you're doing something over 24 strokes a minute. So if you row with your feet out, that's going to limit dropping your weight back on the seat because that's probably one of the biggest issues with erging is people lay back really, really far, almost you know parallel with the floor. And in your stroke cycle, you, ha you then have no time to get your body angle. And it's the same thing with your release in the boat. If you're too long at the release, you're sacrificing the, mo the momentum out of bow because you simply don't have enough time to get your body angle. Um, so I think feet out is, is a good drill. Um, there's a drill you can do without the handle where you just, you just put your hands up behind your head and you just practice your hip hinge and then practice getting your body angle and then moving up the slide. And if you're keeping your hands up behind your neck, that will help you hold your posture and just see, well, how far can I compress before that, that movement starts to break down? And so that might be something that you want to make a, a little mark on the slide and say, okay, I don't want to compress past that point because then I'm going to change the, the position of my back. So those are a couple or, and rowing row without the handle. You know, you can, you can erg and you can practice your crossover. You can practice your level elbows. You can practice all your sequencing. Um, take a couple handles. You can practice all of that on the rowing machine um, without using the, the horizontal handle. Um, I've had several questions come in related to the topic of like handle control and hands on the handles. Um, so one person had asked back when you were talking about um, allowing the hand to pivot while maintaining level wrists and forearms, if you could just further demo that. Um, and then I just recently got a question about um, just generally if you could work on, or how you would work on changing the crossover or improving your handle skills using the finger instead of wrist. So basically the same idea, wanting to elaborate on that. Um, and then someone else just said, I have trouble with light finger and thumb pressure on the handle, but still having lateral pressure on the Orlox for stability. Suggestions. 
okay, good. Well, actually, those are all related, so we yeah. can we can kind of. Um, th there are a couple of a couple of things that become really important um, when if you want to be light on the handles, and if you want to, I have my marker here. I should have brought an or handle here, but I have my marker here. So if you can see my hand here. This, this would be on the drive, but my, my palm is off the handle. This would be feathering. This would be on the drive. This would be feathering. So this is the point of pivot. And this is, this is that exercise I showed you, the isolated lumbricals. Okay, now this is something that like nobody does in their everyday life, right? So, um, so this is something you have to train. And that, but the key here to pay attention to is your, your palm is off the handle. All right. So if I was like that, I mean, I really, I mean, I can't even do it. If you're not letting the, you want to allow the handle to be free. Okay. So, so let, let the handle move in your handle. That's one, one really important thing. If you're gripping the handle, um, how many people remember like Troy's doc talk the first day, remember the grabbing the hot dog, but in the hot dog bun, you know, that that's sort of the grabbing the hot dog bun and, and your, your hand, is um, not allowing the handle to move around. But in order to do these things, you need to, to be rigged correctly, okay? That's huge. You have to have your oarlock set at the right height so that you can rest your weight over the handle, so that you can rest, so that your elbows, your forearm, and your wrist are level to the water and they are above the handle. If you are too high, you're not going to be able to do this because your elbows are going to drop under the handle and you're going to be in a position of pulling the handles down instead of tapping down to try to, try to get them out. So the height is going to affect a lot of things with, with your hand skills. So when, when you are at the right height over the handles, you can simply press down and the blade will come out. You worry about the feather once, once the blade is out, but you've got to have weight in the hands. And as your hands come away, we talked about, remember way back in the beginning, we talked about put enough weight, lean your weight on the handles, try to push your oarlocks down, push the handles down. Um, you don't have to do it a whole lot, but push your handles down until you feel your posture comes up. That also has the, um, the, the oar locks will hold, once you feather, the oar locks are gonna hold your oars. You don't have to hold them, just let them sit there. They're just gonna stay there. You come to the crossover. Rick has a great drill um, called the mini pause drill, mini pause drill at the crossover. And the, you do this micro pause and the, the knuckle of your right hand touches the heel of your left hand. So you're, you're in that position, one handle is following the other. You do a little micro pause whenever you move through the, the crossover on the recovery. Do that little micro pause. Practice this on the erg with just handles because it takes a little bit of retraining. The, the, you, know, you have to retrain the speed of your hands just slightly. Um, but all of those things go back to correct orlock height and keeping weight in the hands. If you have weight in the hands, you do not have to use your thumbs to keep pressure and keep the contact of the orlock to. The pin. If you have weight over your hands, a little body weight, like you're trying to lift yourself out of the seat, that you're going to stay against the pin. So those, those are important things that all kind of work together. Awesome. Um, and I will say I did misread the last question just a little bit. He was mm -hmm. asking about the um, which would have a greater impact, um, changing, working on changing the crossover or improving handle skills. So I don't know if you want to address that quickly. Oh, both. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it's all important, but don't you don't have to do it all in the same day, right? Um, uh, definitely, um, your handle skills in terms of making sure that you're feathering and squaring on the recovery, and that you're not mixing those motions into the entry or the release. I think that's really, really important. Um, the crossover is a big one if you've been rowing that way for a long time. Um, I had to make a change in my crossover last year. I had been rowing a certain way, not left over right, but I had my own sort of idiosyncratic pattern. And Rick suggested I change it. And I spent all last summer changing it. And it was um, after 20 years of sculling that way, to be honest with you, it was surprisingly easy. 
I just decided to let, let my starboard hand stroke and let my port hand follow. And then it seemed to come out okay. But it is going to level you out too, particularly if you tend to be down on port a lot. Um, okay, and then there are a couple questions also related to hands, but these more um, from like a medical mechanical perspective. So one was whether you have any thoughts on protecting hyperextending thumbs. Yes, don't put too much pressure on your thumb. Um, I would say because, I mean, you can, especially if, if you have like an old skiing injury where maybe you've torn that ligament, like that's a real common downhill skier or snowboarders injury too, um, that you're very mobile here in the thumb. One tip I would have say is put your index finger on the corner of the handle and then let your thumb rest where it's most comfortable um, so, that, so that they're close together, but you're not you know, you want to be careful that you're, uh, use my or handle again, you want to be careful, you want to cap over the end of the handle versus if your hand starts to travel down, you're going to put a lot more stress on that joint on your thumb. And if your hand tends to travel down, my suggestion would be shorten your inboard and bring the end of the handle to where your hand, where your finger wants to be, because that might be where you want to be. So, um, so that would be one way to decrease that pressure on your thumb. For sure. Cool. Um, and the next question was um, asking about if you have carpal tunnel nerve damage present, if there is a way um, that you can, or whether there's a recovery or a respite time recommended, or whether it's okay to continue training with clean technique. It depends what your doctor says. Um, I mean, it depends how, if you've had a carpal tunnel release, it depends how far you are, how far along you are after, after that. If you're, you've been released, say, to go back to full ac activity, you know, I would basically let pain be your guide in the sense of um, try not to make it painful, but in the, also in the sense of, you know, you don't want to overdo the activity so that you get more inflammation. Because if you get inflammation, that's what's going to maybe flare up some of your symptoms. And if you've had pretty severe carpal tunnel syndrome, that's a compression syndrome to begin with. So if you have had some um, nerve damage because of compression, and that means because the nerve did not have enough oxygen for a certain period of time, um, depending how bad it is, it may recover 100%, it may not. It depends on the severity of it, but nerves do heal very, very slowly, much slower than muscles do because of, of basically poor blood supply. Um, I would suggest like lots of vitamin B6 and B12, lots of B vitamins help nerves. But um, maybe if you're getting back to technique work, just start out, you know, short sessions, maybe more frequently, but, but short and try not to aggravate the inflammation. If you're finding you're sore afterwards, maybe next time do a little bit less. Okay, um, another question about um, sort of an injury aggravation situation. Um, so this person was saying when they try to keep their knees together, it aggravates their upper abductors on the right leg, which is the leg that wants to veer out. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how to keep that from occurring? So do you think the knees fall apart or they're trying to press their knees together? Uh, it sounds like they're trying to keep them together, resisting the urge for one of them to veer out. Okay, well, this would be a good way to look at what the mobility, this is probably a hip joint mobility issue. So you might have one joint capsule that's tighter than the other one. So, you know, I would say look at your range of motion and um, work on that on land. Uh, another exercise that some people do, like some people use like an elastic, you can buy those elastics for um, like doing monster walks and mini, mini band walks that go around your knees that help train your hips. Um, you could try rowing a little bit on the erg, holding, the water, holding a water bottle between your knees. That's another exercise for, for that kind of working on those, those um, abductor muscles. So those are some things that you could try, but you know, I, I would look at your, the mobility of the joint first and see if you can um, start working on that and improve that and uh, 
go from there. You know, just do the best you can with it. You know, and if it improves a little bit, it's still going to help. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Um, we are getting a little bit past time here. So I think I'm going to go with one last question okay. um, and then we will wrap things up. Uh, so the last question is um, wondering if you could talk about which muscles control how well we set the shell. Your core muscles. <laughs> this is this is our core, right? But but go back to our picture of the diamond frame. You know, I think it's important. I mean, obviously our our core muscles. So um, I'm talking like our activated glutes up to your lats. You know, that is that is our connection between our feet and the oar handle. And um, in terms of stability, like obviously if you don't have a lot of trunk control, like you, you have to have proximal control to have distal control. So you have got to have control of the trunk in order to control the body parts that are far, far away from you. So um, core strength is very important in stability. When, when you make your diamond frame, like if you're sitting at the release and one of the drills I like to do when we're in groups at Craftsbury up on the lake is, you know, I like to do this stationary stability drill where you, you're sitting at the release position. Um, you make sure the height of your oarlocks is correct, which we always do because Eric is our fleet manager. Um, but you sit at the release position. You make sure that um, everything is parallel to the water. We work on contracting our lats. We work on pressing your elbows out towards the oar locks. That activates your lats. It brings your shoulders down. It activates your lats, which is activating a huge part of your core mus musculature. And you can simply, if you push to one side and the other side, your, your boat's going to move. Okay. That's now we're, we're saying provided you have the oar handles at the same height because you could do this too. But um, so, so core stability is very important as well as, um, I like to think of balance as what's happening in the shell. I like to think of stability as what's happening or lock to or lock or rigor, rigor to rigor. So, you know, you've got to have both things. You've got to be even on the seat and even on your feet and um, continue to keep your weight into the pin by following the arcs of the oars. If you stay on your arcs, your, your body weight is in the right place 100% of the time. Okay, awesome. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, I did drop my email in the chat a little while ago. I'll, I'll do it again, actually. Um, that's for anybody who wants to be put on our mailing list to receive updates about the rest of the webinar series. But if, um, if you had a question that you really want answered that we didn't get to, um, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll try to get that directed appropriately. Um, thank you very much, Marlene. That was an awesome presentation. Uh, Great to thank see you, everybody. everybody. Thank you, everybody. Lots of for familiar faces, right? Yeah. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and I dropped the link also a little bit ago for the supplemental materials. That's where you'll find the video in a couple days. And you can also find the information for Will's talk next week. So we hope you'll join us for that and for the rest of the series. And um, thanks again, everybody. Now right. we get to wave at each other as we, uh, as we end the meeting. So yeah. Right, thanks. right. I say Richard, Carolyn, Donovan, Ray, Elaine, Jackie. <laughs> Let's see everybody. Laura, nice to see everybody. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.